Good morning. We'd like to welcome you all to the Laurel Canyon Church of Christ. We're glad that you're here with us this morning, especially if you are visiting with us. We want, we want you to know that you are our honored guest. We're glad that you're here. If you have a moment, please fill out a visitor's card so that we have a record of your attendance here with us this morning and get to know you just a little bit better. We're glad that you're here. When you think about the reason why we have come here this morning, to gather under a, a building together, we are here to worship. We're not here to, to worship ourselves. We're not here to praise and honor and glorify a man or a woman or even a group of people this morning. We are here to praise and honor our God and our Creator. In Galatians chapter 6, in verse 14, it says, But far be it from me to boast, far be it from me to boast in anything except in the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul is writing here that if I'm going to gloat about anything in my life, I'm going to boast about anything, but I'm going to tell you one thing in my life is that Jesus died for me and that he died for you. And we're going to worship this morning that very fact. We're going to sing this morning, praise the Lord. And we'll sing, praise the God of our salvation. We'll sing before the prayer, Lord, we come before thee now. We'll sing before the lesson, our God, he is alive. And for the invitation, we'll hear the call of Zion. Let's focus our hearts and minds this morning on God, our Father, the God who created us with the sound of his voice and use our voices to praise him. We'll start with number 21, praise the Lord. We'll sing all four verses of this song. <clears throat> Our next song, number 68, Lord, we come before thee now. We'll sing all three verses of this song. Yeah. 
at this time, please stand for an opening prayer and then remain standing for our song to follow. Would you bow with me? Our holy and our awesome Father in heaven, the God of our salvation, we boldly stand before this group of people proclaiming your name. May your name endure forever. May the earth be filled with your glory. Father, we are so thankful that we have the ability, we have the freedom, we have the freedom of choice of mind to be here to worship you, to make the choice that you are mo the most important thing in our lives. Father, we're so thankful for everyone that's here. We can worship you together. Father, we have many on our minds that are dealing with difficulty, loss of loved ones, sickness. We pray that you you would be there to comfort them. And we pray that we would do our part to comfort and encourage them. Father, be with those who've made the choice to turn their back on you. Help them to see the error of their way, that we can do our part again to encourage them, to bring them back to you. Father, we pray that you would be with our brother Jason this morning. As he is prepared to present a lesson to us. We pray that you would help him to easily remember the things that he studied, that he can present them in a bold way with a loving attitude and loving mind. Father, help us as listeners to take what he says and search the scriptures to see if those things are true. And if they are, that we would make the necessary changes in our own lives. Father, we pray that you would go with us through this service. Help us to always remember that you come first in our lives. Father, we know that you are alive, and we pray that as we sing and encourage each other, that we would point our focus solely to you. Father, and it's through the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Before the lesson, we'll sing all four verses of Our God, He is Alive. So there is beyond the edge of the
Let me invite you to take a Bible, if you will, and open it with me to the book of Psalms. In the middle of your Bibles, back to Psalm 71, where we will be reading together in just a few moments. We are so very glad that you're here, thankful for a beautiful morning on which to gather. And as has already been mentioned, especially if you're visiting with us, thank you for being here this morning. I want to talk with you from God's Word this morning about something that impacts us all in various ways. This congregation is very, very blessed to have a good span of ages. And we often talk about how blessed this congregation is to have those who are very, very, very young. I want to speak to those of you who are young this morning, but I also want to speak to those of you who are older this morning and use God's Word to, in a sense, bridge that gap and talk about naturally, as life unfolds, how generations relate to one another. It may be that you're a parent this morning or a grandparent or a great-grandparent this morning, and we're thankful for you. It may be that you're a, a child of someone even in this audience this morning, and we're thankful for you, for you, and we're glad that you're here. I want to talk with you about some things that older Christians need to hear from younger Christians, things that ought not to be taken for granted. And I trust that as we go through many of these passages together, that will undoubtedly be spoken by God Himself to us. If you have your Bibles open there to Psalm 71, we'll begin reading in just a moment in verse 9. If there's one statement really that encapsulates everything that we hope to talk about from God's Word this morning, it's this. The world has a cruel way of saying to those who are older, we don't need you anymore. Whereas the church ought to consistently say to those who are older, we have great need for you and of you. Teach us. Lead us along the ancient paths. We can see in one sense that that is on the mind of this psalmist in Psalm 71. If you're following along with our Bible reading calendar, you read this on Wednesday at some point. Psalm 71. We won't take the time to read the entire thing, but notice with me verse 9 beginning. Psalm 71 and verse 9. Do not cast me off. In the time of old age is the prayer of the psalmist to God. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. Look at verse 17. Same psalm. Verse 17. O God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. The world has a cruel way of saying to those who are older, we have no need of you. God's people ought to say consistently to those who are older, we have great need for you. And how can we put that into words? If you open your Bibles with me, we'll be in 2 Timothy in just a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you'll turn nearly to the end of our Bibles together, and you might place a marker there in 2 Timothy 3. We'll come back a couple of times to 1 and 2 Timothy in the book after to Titus. What sort of things do older Christians need to hear? From younger Christians, I would suggest to you they need to hear 
thank you. Thank you for your years of service. Thank you for your faithful example. Thank you for being an encouragement. God's people, those who are older, ought to hear those sorts of things from those who are younger. It was built into God's communication to Israel very early on. For instance, in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 32, God's people are told, You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Notice what's anchored in the fact that I have respect for God. I have respect for what God has to say. I have respect for God's way. And because I respect the great I am, I'm going to follow his directions in tell me I ought to not only have a certain level of honor in my mind and in my heart for those who are older, but I ought to express that honor. In very tangible ways. In this wise book of Proverbs, this is put forth in terms of a family relationship. Children ought to say thank you to father and mother, grandfather and grandmother. Not simply on one or two days that our society has appointed here and there throughout our secular calendar. Not simply even with words. But by our example, by taking seriously what they taught all along. For instance, in Proverbs 23 and verse 22, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother. Notice, when she is old. Well, how can I do that? Practically speaking. Very next proverb, by truth. And do not sell it. By wisdom, instruction, and understanding, by God's design, the home is the very first place to which I am exposed. The home is the most consistent place by God's design. Those things are to be communicated. Truth and wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father, on the other hand, of the, of the righteous, I should say, will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. We'll look at the flip side of that in just a moment. You have your Bibles open to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Begin reading with me in verse 1. Here is an older Christian, Paul, speaking to a younger Christian, Timothy, in a sense passing the torch so that Timothy can consistently and, and, and continue to pass the torch. How's that going to happen? In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1, he says, Timothy, you need to understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. What will make times difficult? People will make times difficult. People who are lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Notice the next one. Ungrateful. Unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Timothy, you avoid such people. This is not the way that the people of God ought to be. Among those sorts of people are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sin and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. He even names 
two men in the Old Testament who model this. Janus and Jambres, they oppose Moses. So also these men, Timothy, in your own day and age, they oppose the truth. They are men corrupted in mind, disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. God's people are to be different. God's people are to be grateful. God's people are to receive God's instruction from generations who come before. And God's people are willing to look, whether it is father or mother, whether it is grandfather or grandmother, whether it is older saints who have taught with their mouths and led by their examples. God's people are to say generation by generation, thank you. Look at the book just before 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. I would suggest to you that older Christians need to hear from younger Christians, we take the faith Seriously. Men and women who have dedicated their own lives to the faith. Men and women who have built their own faith on the faith of the word of God. Young people, they are encouraged when they hear you talking about your faith. But could I be honest with you this morning? Do you know what older Christians are more concerned about even than your faith? They're concerned about the faith. And they're encouraged by you being willing to learn what it is that God wants you to learn and to develop a faith of your own. But they need to hear as your faith develops. And we understand how that happens. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Older Christians need to hear younger Christians who are willing to say, we take the faith seriously. You have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 3. Notice how this is passed from generation to generation. Paul says to young Timothy, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by Faith, the faith has been given to us as stewards. And we are to build our faith, my personal faith, your personal faith on the faith. Timothy, this is what I have been aiming for. And now I'm telling you, this is what you must aim for. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5. The aim of our charge is love. Love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The faith teaches me about love, the love of God. It teaches me that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. That if I love God, I will obey His commandments. And at the very forefront of those commandments is, I love my neighbor as myself. How in the world can I get to the point where I live like that? I have a pure heart, made pure by the faith. I have a good conscience. A conscience that has been cleansed by my obedience to the faith. And now because the faith has come into my heart and I'm, I'm allowing my heart to be shaped by the faith and building my life on the faith, what is developing within me personally is a sincere faith. How big of a deal is this? 
Look at verse 6. Certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Timothy, God's people are not to be like that. Go back with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we'll pick back up where we left off. In 2 Timothy 3, this time verse 10. How is this passed from generation to generation? Perhaps it is a father in the faith like Paul was to Timothy. Perhaps it is an earthly, a biological father or mother or grandfather or grandmother. How is this passed from generation to generation? 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. You, however, Timothy, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Timothy, you need to understand, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But Timothy, God's people are to be different. As for you, continue in what you have learned. Continue in what you have firmly believed. How did, Timothy, you come to believe those things? Remember from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Notice, the faith revealed in the sacred writings had created faith in Timothy's heart. Most tangibly, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul so desperately desired to hear and see Timothy Say, I take the faith seriously. Timothy would so desperately long to see believers in Ephesus, where he had been left by Paul, say, because their hearts had been shaped by the faith. I take the faith seriously. Younger person, if you're Parents are believers. They desperately long to see you say, I take the faith seriously. In the language of John, in 3 John and verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Go with me to the next book of the Bible, the book of Titus, chapter 2. I would suggest to you that older Christians need to hear from younger Christians. We're listening. And we believe you have something worth passing along. We know you're not perfect, we know you've made mistakes, we know you would go back if you could. And undo some things that you did and apply your heart to some things that you left undone. We're not looking to you as Savior. But we are looking to you as someone who has been walking with the Savior longer than we have. And so when it comes to being a father... I know you didn't do that perfectly, but I'm willing to listen and I believe you have something worth passing along. When it comes to being a mother, I'm listening. I believe you have something worth passing along. I know you weren't a perfect parent. I know you haven't been a perfect member of a perfect church, but I believe you have something worth passing 
law. That is the way it has been or should have been among the people of God all along. Look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul, older, speaking to younger Titus, says very similarly to what he said to Timothy. As for you, Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Titus, you teach the faith. And you teach older men to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. You teach older women likewise to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. Paul can't be on the island of Crete at this point. Titus won't be on the island of Crete forever. But there are older men and older women who are there. And they have the opportunity to teach. And then if the Lord wills another generation. Guess what? The younger generation becomes the older generation given enough time. And they have the opportunity to teach. In this context specifically, younger women are to be trained to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the Word of God may not be reviled. How humbling when we realize that the way I handle myself very well may impact the way other people feel about the faith once for all delivered by God. Yeah, this is something I ought to take infinitely more seriously than my golf handicap. Likewise, urge the younger women to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. By God's design, older Christians need to hear from younger Christians. We're listening. We believe you have something worth passing along. And older Christians, by God's design, need to be willing to share. Finally, you go back with me to the Old Testament book of Psalms, Psalm 92. I would suggest to you that older Christians need to hear from younger Christians. You are still needed. This world has a cruel way of communicating to those who are older, we don't need you anymore. God's people are to be different. We have great need for you. God has created that awareness in our hearts. In the language of Job, chapter 12 and verse 12, wisdom is with the aged. Where can wisdom be found? Wisdom is with the aged. Not because they've been perfect. and Not even necessarily every person who is old. You don't develop wisdom simply by growing older. But you do gain a wealth of life experience. And when that life experience is coupled with a heart that for some time has been dedicated to the faith, what you get is wisdom. Understanding in length of days. And so God told Old Testament Israel, you remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you. Your elders and they will tell you. Israel still needed the aged. God's people in the church of the 21st century still need 
the aged. And so where we have our Bibles open to Psalm 92 and verse 12, notice what the psalmist poetically says. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. And they're not able to do everything that they once did. We heard in Psalm 71, there is a time when strength is spent. But the psalmist's prayer to God was, do not cast me off in the time of old age. There is still contribution that can be made. In this context, they still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Thank God that even in this local body of believers, there are older Christians, and they're not able to do everything that they once did, but they're still bearing fruit in their old age. They are full of spiritual vitality. And listen, by their example this morning, getting out when life is difficult, they are declaring that the Lord is upright. He is my God, and there is no unrighteousness in Him. Four things that older Christians need to hear from younger Christians. Perhaps in our homes, Perhaps even today over the phone, but not just today. In days and weeks and months and years ahead. Thank you. We take the faith seriously. We're listening. We believe you have something worth passing along. And you're still needed. This morning we're going to take a moment to sing a, a, a powerful invitation song. That God is calling. And in very real and tangible terms, the reason that many of us first responded to that call is because someone who was older took the time to share that call with us. We talked in our Bible class period this morning about Jesus' powerful beatitude in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the merciful. One of the most profound ways that I can be merciful is sharing the good news of God's grace with someone else. I found God's mercy because someone shared it with me. And now even this very morning, Zion's call continues to ring. And we want to testify by the singing of this song that the Lord is upright. He is good. He is a rock. He is a refuge. Maybe you came into this room and you didn't enjoy that sort of relationship with Him. You haven't enjoyed that to this moment. We want to unashamedly and full of faith share with you this testimony. That he is good. He does good. He gave his only begotten son for you. Just as surely as he gave him for anyone. We want to share the call of the Holy Spirit of God. To repent of your sins. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins. Not because older generations came up with that. And told us that. We're just parroting that. That's what God himself has communicated. If in any way you need to respond to Zion's gracious call this morning, and we can be of help, would you let us know how by coming to the front while we stand and sing?